We on, James? All right, very good. Well, I know what you're all thinking. I didn't know Pastor Ike owned a tie. Wow. <laughs> you always see me in the clerical, so very good, very good. Uh, welcome. Uh, There's a very, very special evening that we have uh, going on tonight. And so I am, I am just uh, delighted uh, that we have a very special guest uh, speaker, family friend of ours uh, from Kalamazoo. Uh, lots of things uh, going on tonight. Um, I happen to be uh, launching my second book this week, Lord of Legends, and so, um, and Paul Meyer has written a, a tremendous foreword in that book. And uh, afterwards, uh, Paul has got all of his books uh, back there in a lovely reception, and you've got my little book back there as well. Um, but anyways, <laughs> Uh, uh, so if you don't get enough time uh, chit-chatting with Dr. Meyer uh, this evening, I will be interviewing him tomorrow morning in between our two services. We have 8 o'clock and at 10.30, and in between from 9.15 to 10.15 is our Sunday school hour. So I will be interviewing him, asking questions, and then the congregation can ask questions as well, and a few more books that will probably be available at that time. <coughs> so with that, where to begin introducing a uh, theologian and historian uh, that uh, we have here among us. There is a saying at the seminary, is that when I was studying there, you hear this a few times every year, is he who walks in the footsteps of great men someday will soon be like them. And I was very humbled and blessed to be able to grow up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where Dr. Meyer lived and did his entire ministry at Western Michigan University. My high school was right across the street. And uh, just having him preach in our congregation and, and national tours and, and books coming out every other year and all sorts of things, it was a really powerful uh, time uh, to be growing up uh, in Kalamazoo uh, during his uh, his tenure there. So uh, Dr. Paul Meyer, he has been the uh, professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University and is still emeritus and resides in Kalamazoo. He is an expert in first century AD. And he also ordained me into the holy ministry back in 2006 in our congregation in Kalamazoo. So that was a real a special time for me as well. Now, speaking of following in the footsteps of great men. Dr. Meyer himself grew up on the campus of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, which is where I went. And his father, Walter Meyer, was the premier resident theologian there with a PhD from Harvard and was an expert in Hebrew. And so just to kind of give an idea, because half of you really have a good sense of who Dr. Meyer is and the other half are really interested and, and not quite sure about who he is. So uh, Walter Meyer, Paul's father, uh, went by Walter A. Meyer Wham, and he started the first original Christian radio broadcast, and you might recognize that today as the Lutheran Hour, but he was ahead of his time and loved the mission and evangelism and the proclamation of the gospel, and so uh, that was when Paul was growing up on, on St. Louis campus, and all of the, the tremendous things. So that's who he is. So Paul's first book, after he earned his 15th PhD, I think, from uh, <laughs> all over the world, uh, he is a very learned man. His first book was a biography about his father, Walter Meyer, and all of uh, the amazing advances of the gospel with the Christian radio uh, back then. And that book is A Man uh, Spoke, A World Listened. And from that book launched many other books uh, that Dr. Meyer did coming out. Uh, most of, uh, notably, his history emphasis. And so Dr. Meyer wrote translations of Flavius Josephus in his writings, Eusebius in his writings. And then he did a tremendous series of books, uh, a trilogy that uh, Christian pastors, Lutheran pastors loved to use, and that was First Christmas, First Easter, and first Christians. And those three came to be known together as in the fullness of time. And so his expert archeology span and history and academics coming together to really unpack and explore uh, and go through the history of Christianity and how it started. So wonderful. Now, if you are thinking, 
Oh, history. <laughs> this is boring. This is dry. They're dust on the words. Dr. Meyer also likes to tickle the Indiana Jones bones in all of us as well. And so he has uh, written a fascinating trilogy. Uh, the first book was Skeleton in God's Closet, which Hollywood is just waiting to put on the screens, the, these stories, and it's a lot of fun. He's also got other historical novels about Pontius Pilate and the flames of Rome. He has written seven children's books as well. So there are more than five million copies in print of all of Dr. Meyer's books, and, uh, and they have been uh, translated into over 20 languages. He still lectures wild, widely to this day and appears on national radio, television, and print interviews for decades and decades and decades. So clearly, you get an idea. He is one of the smartest guys in the world, honestly, and uh, with just uh, what he knows. How smart is he? He has four lovely daughters, and he sent three of them to Michigan State University. <laughs> that is how smart he is. That is how smart he is. So. <laughs> his latest book, his latest book is... The Genuine Jesus, Fresh Evidence from History and Archaeology. And what this is, is taking the breadth of his work with that In the Fullness of Time series, and as they were written so many years ago, there are more things that have come out and been discovered and unearthed. And so bringing that to light and repackaging that and putting that together for a fuller, richer story as we all await the imminent nearness and return of Christ uh, we truly have a treasure uh, among us this evening and uh, tomorrow morning as well. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Reverend Dr. Paul Meyer as we get to enjoy an evening with him. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Eric. Man, is this now? Good show. So, members of Bethel Lutheran Church, and I'd to thank you beyond that also, thank you for turning out in such numbers this evening. And pardon the slight speech impediment I have. I had a stroke four years ago, and it left me with this, among other problems, in terms of speech. But when I get enthusiastic, I finally get over it, and I hope you do too, once you know how to translate me. Okay? Anyway, you'll notice that the remarks this evening are titled the same way my latest book is. So please don't think that this is a book review. I can see you heading for the exits immediately. No, 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 no. Uh, what can an author say about his own book? But it's, you know, fantastic, sensational, intriguing, and so forth. Well, so let's eliminate all that kind of stuff. And let me tell you, the challenge of that second uh, line on the title, the subtitle, Fresh Evidence from History and Archaeology. Okay, Meyer, what is that fresh evidence? I thought I would dwell on that this evening. And it's amazing that in the greatest life ever lived, which has more copies uh, than any other biography in the world, except maybe for the thoughts of Chairman Mao or something like that. Uh, you have in the Bible the world's bestseller, and you also have a, uh, a tremendous life story in the case of Jesus and the apostles. But by now, with 2,000 years of scholarship, don't you think every last detail about the life of Christ would have been discovered by now? The answer is, be prepared for a surprise. There are new insights that are possible every time you turn back to the Bible and understand it in terms of its background in history and in <clears throat> theology. So we're going to try to show you some of the new things we hope that you're hearing about Jesus for the first time this evening, okay? <clears throat> and then afterwards, we're going to have a question period which I understand from Pastor Eric is going to be in the Great Hall. It's a good name for anticipated crowds, believe me. 
Okay, now let's talk about why a book like this. You are mostly good Christians and you probably don't know what's going on outside of church relations or in the general press on Jesus. He is being attacked mercilessly, not from the pulpit, but in some churches it is from the pulpit. And you have here rather a version of Jesus that comes down to you as a, a fraud that the Christian church perpetrated on the world. Some claim Jesus never even lived. Others claim, well, he lived, but he wasn't who he said he was, and so on into the night. And they have instead substitute versions of Jesus which are execrable in many ways. They are outrageous. And if any of you uh, have winced at the various outrageous versions of who Jesus really was, then maybe this is a story that you may be interested in and that you have been waiting, <coughs> waiting for. There's something about the human being that likes to overthrow the status quo. And so often you find, therefore, that <coughs> Jesus scholars who should know better want to make a name for themselves. And therefore, they make a big fuss about something that's pretty obvious. But again, they think it's new information, and therefore, they want to be dazzle the masses. I'm going to give you some examples of caricatures of Christ, and you can judge whether Jesus is the one that you learned in Sunday school and Bible class, or the new version. <clears throat> And some of them you find very difficult, I think, to find and to swallow and to accept. First of all, it all began a half century ago with the works of a, <clears throat> a British author uh, who wrote the Passover plot. You remember that when your high school kids came home and talked about how the English teacher had assigned you to read the Passover plot, which is really making church and state pretty badly. And it's a terrible book. It means that Jesus pl plotted his own crucifixion and death and resurrection. And uh, this is something went wrong when he was going to take the opiate at the cross to make him a fake death. He got too big and he died anyway. But then he never was resurrected again. The colony of Christians was scattered on one of the hills in Jerusalem. And therefore, we never heard from them again, is what he loved to say. But it turns out that instead, it was the most successful single phenomenon and expansion in the, his in the history of humanity. <clears throat> the Passover plot by Hugh Schoenfield, his name was, was followed by a lot of criticism. His Jewish colleagues were honest enough to say the Passover plot is an embarrassment to us. And uh, thank you. It was an embarrassment to us. And it's not logical at all. And it was pretty well condemned by his own people. There, Jewish people were acting nobly in the name of the truth, and I respect them for it. But this is only the beginning now of the attacks on Jesus. They get worse and worse. Then there was Jesus, the radical revolutionary. Jesus was not a gentle savior leading his people in peace. He was a radical revolutionary seeking to overthrow the government in the name of a new revolution. Um, one of Jesus' disciples was named Simon the Zealot. Uh-oh, there's the name. The Zealots were the political party that went to overthrow Rome at the time in ancient Palestine. And they never got very far, as you well know. But in this, there was the uh, statement about Jesus uh, telling his disciples to buy two swords. They brought him two. He said, that's enough. That's enough. And then his final no to messianism 
within the garden of Gethsemane when he tells Peter, take that sword and put it back in the sheath. That's Jesus not being a political messiah. And so we had the uh, author of that series making a big fuss about his findings now that Jesus was a radical revolutionary whom Rome hated and their governor, Pontius Pilate, wanted to kill him. Uh, needless to say, that thesis fell on its face as well. Then we have other suggestions. I don't think you like any of them anymore. We have, uh, uh, who's up? Who can know who the next one is? Uh, Jesus the <clears throat> Jesus the mushroom cultist. Oh please, what do they mean this time? Well, the um, author was a respected uh, scholar until he went crazy. I mean, I hate to say that, but it's virtually what happened. He said that Jesus was <clears throat> a uh, person who worshiped the crazy mental antics necessary to believe in a mushroom cult. It wasn't the cross that was important. It was the sacred mushroom. The sacred mushroom uh, is indicated by the raising of Lazarus. What? Okay. Uh, again, even though this is insanity, let me tell you what is being taught and believed. Okay, uh, Jesus, the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus sounds like lapis lazuli, which is the Persian purple, or Mesopotamian purple. I don't think it's the same, but let's say it is. Um, it's named for Lazarus because Lazuli sounds like Lazarus and it is the famous red top white flecked mushroom with a white stalk. You see the bottom of that red cap it's also white spokes in it. Um, <clears throat> A pathetic guess because, first of all, lapis doesn't sound terrific like lapis lazuli, the great Mesopotamian blue. But again, we have Lazarus <clears throat> with uh, sp uh, spikes in his hair uh, from the grave wrappings. And there you have the white flecks on top of the mushrooms. Um, just, you know, there's no sanity there. You can't find a declarative sentence there that makes any sense. But it's different. Doubleday published 800 pages of it because in the index there was a big uh, discussion in eight languages. And because of the different difference in languages, obviously this guy must be a scholar. And so they were hoodwinked into publishing the 700 page book. Half of it footnotes and half of it, oh, it must be a wonderfully scholarly book. So, uh, never mind that the footnotes make no sense. There's senseless footnotes in the back of the book. And uh, I, I didn't want to knock anybody else's writings, but when it's further added that, that Jesus never lived, and this is a myth about him, that's when I get angry. I get very angry at that because anybody who tries to sell you a bill of goods by saying Jesus was a myth, he never lived, don't know what they're talking about. They are advertising their ignorance. Uh, we have so much testimony in pagan hostile sources that there was a Jesus Christ and that he was crucified by one of our governors, Pontius Pilate. Exactly as the New Testament has it. Uh, that's a famous quote from Tacitus in his Annals, uh, Book 44, 
section 15. Tacitus talks about the great fighter of Rome and how Nero got arrested for it. Whether or not he's guilty, we're still not sure to the present day. But nevertheless, Tacitus tells about this and says that first, the ringleaders of the sect of Christians were arrested. They were named for their founder, Jesus Christ. And the putrid rumor was almost extinguished until suddenly it got to Rome, where things hateful come from all the Mediterranean world and find their abode. Uh, so we don't have a friendly source here, we have a hostile source. And that hostile source nevertheless admits that the leaders of, were arrested and then vast numbers were arrested. We'll talk about that one later on in connection with the third section. Vast numbers. That shows that Luke wasn't kidding us when he said there were 3,000 converts on Pentecost and then 5,000 more a short time later. So these people don't even know the Roman literature to, do, to believe something like that. Terrible thing. <clears throat> uh, no serious scholar today anywhere in the world claims that there never was a Jesus. Uh, this is just a, an example of people, as I say, flaunting their ignorance rather than helping the cause of more information about the greatest life ever lived. <clears throat> And then there's, of course, uh, an Australian author who gets a book out about Jesus as the uh, <clears throat> Jesus as the uh, uh, one who defied death and lived on a jolly old so he was a jolly old man. And uh, I don't begrudge Jesus a longer life. But there's no evidence that he lived an earthly existence beyond age 33, 35, 36. But it just keeps going. Uh, probably the most ridiculous book on Jesus I've ever seen, the most anti-scholarly, the most, the most uh, <clears throat> ridiculous, as I say, irrational, really. It's an irrational book was by an Australian theologian whose name was Barbara Thiering. You may never hear her name again, in which case, congratulations, and don't, <laughs> don't worry about the fact. But uh, Barbara Thiering seriously upsets all the geography. Jesus wasn't crucified in Jerusalem. He was crucified at Qumran, this is the capital of the people who wrote us the Dead Sea Scrolls, remember? And then he, he, she goes on to say that Jerusalem itself is Qumran, and the Sea of Galilee is part of the Dead Sea. In other words, every geographical name has to be seen through the eyeglasses of a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. A terrible book. And Jesus himself, of course, yeah, he existed, but. Uh, uh, again, he was a part of the Dead Sea community. Doesn't work. Does anyone remember that terrible book that came out by a, <clears throat> an ancient historian in New York, professor of ancient history, whose name was uh, <clears throat> oh, think, 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 think for a second. Uh, he was writing a book on the uh, real Jesus, yeah, that's, that was the name of his book, The Real Jesus. He was, uh, again, a fellow who interviewed Mark late at night, The Secret Gospel of Mark, it was called. And here you have the professor of history uh, doing this job, canceling out any logic in the process, and then you have this uh, terrible thing said about Jesus. Uh, in which he implies homosexuality was involved there, until a Canadian apologist, a good author for Christianity, was able to show that this fellow was absolutely overcome 
with interest in uh, the, this uh, New York University historian who was making this claim. And he was hitting the same things that he was having uh, Mark secretly find out from Jesus. And these things in, include <clears throat> uh, visitations by night, uh, uh, special ways to pray, uh, the uh, austere living, and then uh, also the hint at homosexual activity, just disgusting. This is the kind of thing which is kind of hitting us left and right and up and down. And so it goes. I don't need to mention any more examples to show you how really lousy this is. And it needs to be opposed because it's not even logical in its presentation. It's certainly against the historical method. And the world outside that might have listened to Christianity is at that time ready to turn off the faith. Because see, I thought something was fishy about all this. They believe the lie rather than the truth. And this is why you have to have occasional people who are willing to sacrifice their time and effort and blow the whistle on this ridiculous kind of rot. And so a new first chapter was in the book that I wrote, and that is called Christ, Christ or Caricature. And here I try to show that all these images of the Lord that are desecrating and disgusting are part of this plot against Jesus. And indeed, I'm prepared also for the ammunition that may come my way in the process because these people don't like to be crossed and they play for real and they play for keeps. And so <clears throat> I'm not anticipating martyrdom. No, no, don't, don't uh, feel any sympathy yet. But uh, anyway, who knows? But it's a very important thing to clear the air first and to show how deceiving and ridiculous these things are. <clears throat> now, in going through the life of Christ, what I tried to do was to hit some of the difficult items as well as the simpler items, explain them, and then see how they were received in a first century atmosphere. And uh, in the process, uh, I hope to show you that some of this put down is not only justified, but very fresh information indeed. And in a way you can also defend the faith without half trying. <coughs> Excuse me. Now in going through the life of Christ, it's always fun to begin at the beginning. You know, people love children's stories. So does the Bible. And so indeed, this is why we have the picturesque details of the first Christmas. The shepherds, the magi, the uh, priestly opposition, the flight to Egypt, all interesting details. But there's one aspect of the nativity account that doesn't seem to jive with the rest. And I refer to the killing of those poor innocent babies in Bethlehem. Didn't that ever bother you as the one aspect of the Christmas story that doesn't fit? And why is it in the Bible? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, we have only Matthew reporting that one. Uh, Luke doesn't. He, Luke deals with the shepherds. And Matthew deals with King Herod and the killing of the babies. And by the way, some people use that different approach as an indication that the Gospels are no, no longer valid. That's wrong. People will look at the same event somewhat differently and cast it differently. And I had, a, well, I think about just having graduated from the seminary, I had a big debate in the American Lutheran magazine with a scholar from Wagner College in Long Island, a Lutheran scholar, believe it or not, of the other synod, of course, uh, who uh, said that this is Matthew's myth, that there never was Herod killing those poor babies. The first martyr of the church was not Jesus, not John the Baptist, Stephen. The first martyr was the first baby killed. 
The first boy baby who was under two years old. There's no question about that. But isn't it a horrid story? And, and this is, maybe these scholars are kind of coming along and saying, that's Matthew's myth. And of course, if that's Matthew's myth, what else did he tell stories about? How creative was his imagination? This is a core gospel. And uh, you're very dangerous if you ever dredge out on that ground. And then what the, the scholars try to do is uh, go and find another reference to a king killing the babies in his country. And they finally found it. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but it's the only outside reference to Herod killing babies. And it beautifully supports exactly Matthew's record from a pagan Roman source. Not a Christian apologist, pagan Roman source. And this is one that I kept out of the fire because I reused it. And it is very effective. It is a reference to Herod's massacre. It goes like this. Now, who was this guy, the Roman pagan author? His name, if you can believe it, was uh, Aurelius Macrobius. Macrobius. He was a pagan in the fourth century, later after 341 sometime AD, who wrote a book called the Saturnalia. That's the end of the year festival. And it's named because this is when masters and slaves exchanged gifts and had many of the trappings of our Christmas event. <clears throat> and indeed, here's, to quote Microbius exactly, it doesn't easily fit the Bethlehem massacre, but this is how you have to do a little sleuthing to make it work. First of all, he says, uh, when August, see, Augustus at the end of the year would be the great impresario who would amuse the people by funny stories, and uh, then they would talk about it until the next year, because he was something of a genius, no question that Augustus was. And that's the reason it got such currency, because the emperor said it, the emperor remembers his famous statement. First, I'm going to give you the statement and show you why it's so clever. Now, he used to be the friend of Herod the Great. He gave Herod the Great the administration of the Holy Land and so on. And he said, <clears throat> Herod, he said, I would rather be, no, it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. Why? Because when he heard that Herod had killed all the babies two years old and under in Syria, he also executed his own son, which means it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. Now, it works out perfectly. It's a, it's a, it shows he's a genius. Pig is porcum in Latin, as uh, Eric's mother will certainly be able to tell you. I'll check with her later about that, the tenses and so forth. Okay, I'd rather be Herod's pig porcum than his son, filium. See, porcum and philium sound alike. That's one part of the joke. The other part of the joke is Jews don't like pork, do they? There's not on the Jewish menu. So the whole idea is uh, it, it, porkers can get through successfully as little animals. Augustus is not going to eat pork, see? And so for that reason, it's a clever statement. And that gave it all the fuel it needed to cross many centuries. It's included even in the Lobe Classical Library. Rather be heard. But the whole point of our interest is the introduction to that, not the actual joke. It's the introduction. When Octavian Augustus had heard that Herod had killed all the babies in Syria and uh, two years old and under and so forth, all the boy babies, and uh, uh, then it added to that, killing his own son, uh, you know, he said, well, the whole idea is to get the word son in there so he'd make a pun. But the big news is that we have a reference 
to a monarch killing babies in his kingdom. Now, as it stands, it won't work. But here's where we have to do the detective work. When Herod had heard that Herod had killed all the babies in Syria, oh no, no way! Syria was the land north of Israel. If Herod had killed all the babies there, they would have killed him. No question about it. Herod had no jurisdiction, whatever, in the area north of Palestine. And uh, we start to break up the case when I tell you what's the Roman name for Palestine. It's Syria dash Palestina. And so through the centuries, you have the Palestinians dropping away because you want a quick, you know, statement as to what the emperor said. So we do know that they're talking about Herod's Bethlehem, which was in, again, uh, Syria, Palestina. And then others have said, well, the, the unbelievers don't like this one at all because this shows that even uh, something as you know, unbelievable as a massacre of uh, boy babies. But then what are the details? Uh, he says, all the boy babies, two years old and under. Now, wait a minute. There we have the clue. Boy babies, less than two years old, two years old and under. My point is this. You have the same code for this, uh, this uh, emperor killing his kids. Same code. Two, and a half, two years old and under, and boy babies. Now tell me, does Herod then go out across the land and kill everything in sight under the idea of, hey, here's a good rule, two years old and under? Ridiculous. The chances of him doing that again anywhere else are ridiculous. There's no other record historically of Herod doing any such killing except in Bethlehem. And so clearly we restored that one because I'll, I'll hold that argument against any comer. And that is that this was indeed a garbled version of the Bethlehem massacre. There's no other things it could be. And so it shows that God has left us these little bits of evidence across the centuries. Our job is to find them and use them. I truly believe that. So, hey, any potential scholars in the room, if you want to go help yourself, uh, you treat Jesus' way, however you do it, but please try it biblically. It's the best way to do it. So here we have a case of where we try to Restore the good sources we have, which may be a little garbled, but nevertheless, they are accurate. So that's the kind of thing you can do elsewhere with, the, with Jesus' evidence. They put it down in places, but it can be restored. Any questions so far about this kind of evidence that we will use, which may be, again, not too impressive to you people, but it's a lot of fun to work with. It really is. <clears throat> then if there are other questions and comments I know one's going to come up it's going to run something like this why do we have to have such a story at all isn't that awful that this could happen and by the way and then when the younger critic in the room will now stand up and say wait a minute here we have Matthew talking about Herod and killing babies. And we find Luke talking about the shepherds and the maid, and not the many shepherds, the shepherds. Beautiful pastoral scene. And the heavens opening up with the glory of God. Uh, but please give God the opportunity to celebrate a little bit. I think if he were, again, marking a great epoch in the universe where he himself sent his son to die for us, that he should be celebrating the fact. I think it's okay. Okay for God to do that. We'll never learn about it. She's important because she's the only way Mary's going to find out anything about the Christmas story. She has to be involved. 
And we know that because Luke gives us two special footnotes on Mary, showing where he got his information. How did they go? But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. And she told me, Luke, you know, later on, he, he doesn't have that, because Luke's very impersonal. But, this, but nevertheless, because it worked out that Jesus was innocently involved in this process of the Magi asking a stupidly wrong question of a reigning king. These guys should have taken high school psychology 100, and they wouldn't have asked such a dumb question. Because look what happened as a result. Anyway, so then years later, when Luke came into the picture and Mary repeated the account, she now told Luke's version of it so that she wouldn't have to go through the awful scene of telling mothers why their babies died. Now, that may be heresy on my part, I don't know. But it's an idea I have. I think it may be the reason. It's hard to say. <clears throat> uh, the child, of course, has become a man. And the man is uh, our Lord and Savior of Jesus Christ. There's more books been written about him than anyone else in history. And as we go through his life, we will see many occasions in which we can bring in fresh evidence. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, the references to Jesus' first sermon. And here we have a parallel to what happened in the 20th century, 21st century. Eric, I don't know where you preached your first sermon. Was it here in Florida? Oh, yeah? Okay. Very often you find that uh, your uh, newly based pastors will give their first sermon at their home congregation. So did Jesus. His first recorded sermon is in the synagogue at Nazareth. And indeed, here he, he's uh, very humbly attending service, and he's given the honor of reading the pericope that day, the epistle lesson. So he gets it and reads it, and then he humbly and respectfully closes the, 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 the scroll and sits back down again. And the ruler of the synagogue says, would you like to comment on that? And Jesus, of course, just had to be laughing inwardly because he was reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And there's no prophet in the Old Testament that has it more accurately in the future than Isaiah. And so here he is talking about the prophet who prophesied himself. And so he lets go in the synagogue. So convincing was his talk that many of the congregation thought the Messiah had come and it was a big deal. And they were praising the Lord for that. You can imagine it if the Messiah were unveiled in a given congregation today, if that could happen. Well, uh, Jesus then used the Old Testament to talk about the pride of the people and he accused them of their sin and their conspiracy and their, and their uh, uh, ugly attitude toward the true God. And then it got them, ang got them angry and they then decided to take Jesus and throw him over the cliff at Bethlehem into the valley of Jezreel, not not far below. Uh, as you know, Jesus disappeared from the group. His passion was not yet to take place. But here's what's interesting. Critics have attacked that one, saying, there's no cliff in Nazareth like that. There are armchair critics who have never taken a trip to the Holy Land. Because if they ever got there, they would find that Nazareth is perched up on an elevation to get there, you've got to go six switchbacks for the bus to climb that cliff. It's not a cliff, of course, really. It's not a 90 degree cliff like that. That's ridiculous, no. It means that you can start pushing a person downhill and he'd tumble all the way to the bottom, that's what it means. And so it's cliff enough for me. So nature does cry out 
the present day, uh, that these things are very, very true. Look at the geography of them. And so it's always such a fun to get there and smile and then notice the anguished look of any of the atheists nearby. Um, <clears throat> there's also the, um, the question about uh, <clears throat> the uh, return from Egypt. So many people make the fuss that hold it. Luke has the Holy Family going back to Nazareth with Jesus, whereas Matthew has them going first on the flight to Egypt. Now, I know it looks pretty starkly different, but it's not that different because it's very easy to harmonize the two. Both things happen, clearly. Now, it's not a problem really at all. <clears throat> and yes, sometimes you can't even take it all in, what God has provided for us. <clears throat> His early ministry was indeed uh, blessed by God beyond any anticipation. They came out to him in droves. They came out to him so much so that he had to take a boat ride to get away from the people to get to the other side. The cliff where Jesus taught has still been identified, by the way, and so has many of the sites. You can almost read any of the Gospels and there it is, folks, you know, in the third dimension of reality. And it's just wonderful to see something as beautifully grounded by what you can see today as never before. Then there was the move to Capernaum. That's only because they wanted to kill him in North Judea. And they, again, were confusing Jesus with John the Baptizer. And uh, Jesus went along with it. He went to Capernaum, which was right at the top of the Sea of Galilee, where the Jordan River flows into Judea and so forth. So they went there, and here he called most of his disciples, except for Judas Iscariot, who came from Judea. He's the only non-Galilean among the crew. And of course, Peter was the uh, leading spokesman for the 12. And he, of course, was always ready to show his authority by answering Jesus' questions first. If you were right or wrong, it made no difference to him. If he got the word in first, that's what caused, caused his uh, success. And so Peter often was Spoke too fast and was wrong, but nevertheless, we can sympathize with that guy. Uh, he's the only one who provided some resistance for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you recall, hacking off the ear of uh, not a great way to begin a revolution, as you well know. <clears throat> but Capernaum was a perfect place to start the ministry because here we have the story of the famous Jesus boat. Yeah. Has a boat been discovered which Jesus and the disciples could have used? Answer is yes. It's 17 feet long, it's 7 feet wide, and all 12 disciples plus Jesus could have fit on board. So they started calling it the Jesus boat. And although it's not. But it's interesting how Again, we, we have here the immediate association with Jesus. Don't tell me he wasn't a great man. Don't tell me he wasn't God's nomination uh, if this happened, but it did. It turns out that the boat was built so that it sailed at the time of Jesus. Whether or not Jesus actually rode that craft, we don't know. But nevertheless, it has been discovered when you go to the Sea of Galilee today, they no longer give you boat rides. They go to that kibbutz there, which found the boat. What a job they did on it. The Sea of Galilee had not had no rain, had no rain for months on end. Sea level drops, 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 until at the bottom, muddy bottom. And there, one evening, two brothers, 
were out walking and they saw the remains of the CEO, of the board of the CEO. And then they carefully had two teams, three teams of archaeologists working eight hours each. In 11 days, they scraped both clear of any mud and then sailed it on shore where they had built a swimming pool for it so it could be resubmerged in Sea of Galley waters so that there could be indeed a, <clears throat> a memorial to Jesus' ministry. And uh, so they did. And it's been an international discovery ever since. <clears throat> we'll tell you about some of the other ones subsequently. But I have to, at this point, question the time. I'm supposed to talk about a half an hour here and then maybe answer questions a half hour in the Great Hall. So who's ever in charge, Pastor Eric or his mother? <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Good she show. always likes to think so. She always likes to think so. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at 7.20 right now, and so we said we we're going to go 6.30 to 8 o'clock. So if we uh, transition back into the Great Hall, we have a lovely reception back there. And a lot of books uh, to sign and interact with and, and uh, talk. And so obviously uh, you've got uh, plenty of questions uh, to pepper him with, as well as tomorrow morning during Bible study class. Uh, so, uh, But I, I think at this point we, we should probably transition to the Great Hall. But uh, let's give him a, a, a warm uh, applause here. Uh, it's inspiring, sir. Very oh. inspiring. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, if you head back through uh, that side or that side, it'll funnel into the uh, the great hall, and uh, we'll be delighted to see you back there.